So I know this video is a little later than usual compared to previous years, but hey, better late than never, right? 2023 has been quite the year for video games, and I mean that in both a good and bad way. On one hand, we've seen a plethora of beloved new games get released in the past year, to the point that many have claimed this to be one of, if not the best year in video game history. On the other hand though, 2023 has been a disastrous year when it comes to game development. Between the thousands of unnecessary employee layoffs, studios being closed down left and right largely thanks to higher up mismanagement, hacks that led to confidential personal information getting released online, and even at award shows meant to celebrate those who create these fantastic games, they were left with only 30 seconds to express their gratitude before they were literally prompted to wrap it up and walk off, if they were even lucky to get awarded on the main stage. Gotta leave time for the ads and the celebrity guest appearances who were given no such time constraint, but I'm gonna stop myself before I go off on a further tangent. Point is, 2023 has been really rough for developers, and my heart goes out to those who've been impacted by the numerous layoffs, closures, and hacks the industry's had to deal with this past year. And as this video goes on, I want you all to remember that behind each of these games are people who put their blood, sweat, and tears into showcasing their passion and creativity for the world to see. I know this isn't the kind of note I usually like to start my videos on, but I have a lot of passion and respect for game development, and given what they've had to go through this past year, I want to give a personal thank you to the developers out there for their contributions to this medium. With that said though, while I wouldn't quite agree with the notion that 2023 has been the absolute best year in gaming history, even for just game releases, I won't deny that it's certainly up there. Now granted, largely thanks to the big move I went through, I didn't actually play a lot of the hugely popular games that came out in 2023. And I really mean a lot. Like, here's a list of notable games from last year that I didn't end up playing. I could keep going, but I'm sure you all get the idea. And I'm willing to bet some of you are now wondering what the heck I did end up playing. Well, still quite a bit. Mostly smaller games, but quality games nonetheless. Enough so that I felt like upping the ante and making it a top 15 this year. Now like with the 2022 list, there will be light spoilers all throughout. And if I decide to go into deeper spoiler territory for a specific game, I'll be sure to make it known at the start of the segment. Though before we get to the main event, there is something new I want to try first and foremost. So I've got a few different kind of games I want to talk about here. This section's going to focus on games I feel like I didn't play enough to warrant putting them on the list, games I liked but not enough to put on the list, and finally, my favorite game I played for the first time in 2023 that came out before 2023. For that first category, we've got Vernal Edge. Some of you may recall that I did a review of the game's Kickstarter demo a few years back, and I know some were expecting me to do a video on the full game. Well, I was planning to originally, but my attention ended up going elsewhere, and since then, I haven't played a whole lot more of this game. Admittedly, I feel like Vernal Edge's early game is a bit too directionless. The game kind of just throws all these various islands at you without much idea of where to go or what you're even looking for, and also without many clear roadblocks to tell you that you're not supposed to be here yet, and it can be a tough hurdle to get over. Either that or I'm just having a skill issue, which is entirely possible. But that said, the combat's pretty good, and the visuals are great. I especially liked the low-poly 3D models for the islands in the world map. Gave me a nice DS-era feel. I'll get back to playing through this eventually, but not in time for this list. Next up in the honorable mentions, Street Fighter VI. So in the grand scheme of things, I haven't played this game a whole lot. Like, I've only done a handful of the arcade mode runs, and I basically haven't touched online at all. 95% of my experience with this game has been the World Tour campaign mode. And even that I haven't finished yet, though I am pretty far into it. Which on that note, I think World Tour is a pretty cool campaign for a Street Fighter game, especially being able to make your own fighter character. I initially tried making mine look somewhat like my avatar, but it never quite looked right. So once I unlocked everything I needed, I went a different direction. Yeah, gotta say, you're photogenic. This game is officially the best Crash Bandicoot game to come out in 2023. Now I do have a few issues with Street Fighter VI. Much as I have enjoyed World Tour, I think its pacing can be a bit awkward at points, and it also gets kind of grindy. On top of that, the game's monetization is, uh, not great. 
But at its core, Street Fighter VI is a solid fighting game, with strong gameplay mechanics, a great roster of characters both old and new, a pretty striking visual style, and as someone who often struggles with memorizing those more complex attack inputs in the heat of battle, the inclusion of the modern mode input system I'm very thankful for. Now I can be... somewhat decent at a traditional fighting game. Going into a genre that I am more experienced with, though, the next honorable mention is Rocket Racing. Also known as, OK Epic Games, you got me to download Fortnite, are you happy? For those who may be unaware, this is a new arcade racer from the developers of Rocket League, available specifically within Fortnite. And honestly, this is an idea I've wanted for a while now. Well, not the bundled within Fortnite part, but like, a racing game with Rocket League's mechanics and physics just sounded like a fun, if chaotic, idea. And that's exactly what Psyonix delivered. Granted, it is really light on content currently, so it did start to feel a bit repetitive after a couple sessions with some friends, but the game itself is quite fun, taking Rocket League's crazy physics and making them snappier and better suited for a high-speed racer. Not my favorite racer experience from the year, we'll get into that in the list itself, but there's fun to be had here. Now will I end up playing any of Fortnite itself? Probably not. And finally, for my favorite pre-2023 game that I played for the first time in 2023, Hyper Light Drifter. A close friend of mine has been recommending this game to me for a while now, and I finally played it this past year for a video that I ended up shelving. I might revive that video idea in the future though, so I'll be keeping that a secret. And wow, this is incredible! From the weighty combat, to the foreboding atmosphere, to some of the most gorgeous pixel art I've ever seen in a video game, Hyper Light Drifter was quite the challenge, but such a treat to play through. I can definitely see why my buddy's been wanting me to play this for so long. Sorry it took so long, Sean, but I finally Hyper Light drifted. That was a terrible joke, I apologize. Though yeah, between it and Solar Ash, I'm officially all caught up on Heart Machine's games. And good timing too, what with Hyperlight Breaker going into early access this year. Definitely looking forward to that. But that's enough about what didn't make it onto the list. So without further delay, here are my top 15 favorite games of 2023. Alright, so admittedly, I'm starting this list off with a bit of a cheat. My number 15 is not a full game, but rather a DLC that actually started coming out before 2023. However, as some of you may recall, I've previously included a single post-launch candidate in my Games of the Year videos, namely Deltarune Chapter 2 in 2021 and the Cuphead DLC in 2022. Well, I'm doing it again. So the winner of Benjamage's official Game of the Year post-launch candidate award for 2023 is the Booster Course Pass. I did debate for some time on whether I should consider this or not, but the Booster Course Pass does literally double the course amount in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, on top of adding several more playable characters. Plus, just being up front, a good chunk of my game time in 2023 has been playing through these new courses as they came out with my siblings. And with the releasing of Waves having wrapped up this year, I felt like counting it for this list. Now granted, I'll definitely agree with the notion that the Booster Course Pass had its rough patches throughout. Quite a few of the courses weren't given the same visual quality as the base game, especially in the earlier waves. Some choices for returning courses were a bit baffling, like we could have gotten Delfino Square or Airship Fortress as Mario Kart DS reps, but instead we got Shroom Ridge and Mario Circuit. And some courses were just not given the best treatment. What on earth happened with Sunset Wilds? But as a whole, I really enjoyed the Booster Course Pass. Several of the returning courses made the jump to Mario Kart 8 really well, so being able to play more of these classics now in this game was a delight. My favorite course in the whole series, DK Mountain, got an excellent rendition, to name one example. But also, the Booster Course Pass actively made some of these courses better than before, especially in the case of Super Circuit. Like, I'm not the biggest fan of Super Circuit or its courses, barring a couple exceptions, but now I actively pick courses like Boo Lake and Riverside Park. They were both given really fun makeovers. Probably my favorite upgrade made to a returning course, though, was for Calamari Desert, a course I already enjoyed quite a bit in Mario Kart 64. My sisters and I would often drive down the train tracks in 64's rendition just for the fun of it, so now making the train tracks a mandatory section was such a fun surprise that I feel elevated the course's quality. Great addition. Though we can't quite talk about the Booster Course Pass without addressing the big focus of it, the inclusion of Mario Kart Tour's original courses. I've seen some people complain about the overabundance of Tour representation in the DLC, and while I definitely see the point being made there, it's also clear that part of the reason the DLC was made to begin with was to give Tour's original courses a home for when Tour eventually goes offline. 
and for me personally, as someone who tried Tour but could never get into how it controlled, on top of the monetization issues it had initially, I do like being able to race on these newer courses in a console Mario Kart game. Plus, while the real world location courses were kinda hit or miss, the ones that were hits tended to be really fun. And I'll admit this is very much personal bias, but my favorite of them is Vancouver Velocity. Having been to Vancouver more times than I can count, seeing various landmarks and part of the city imagined in Mario Kart course form was an absolute treat. And that's before mentioning the non-real-world tour courses, like Ninja Hideaway, Squeaky Clean Sprint, Merry Mountain, and the absolutely delightful Yoshi's Island. And the booster course pass would feel special enough as is if they just stuck to doubling the course amount and calling it a day, but nah, they went further and started adding more characters to the roster partway through. Seeing Birdo back was neat, but then bringing back Petey Piranha and Wiggler, and finally adding Kamek to a console Mario Kart game was so cool to see. Kamek was planned to be playable as far back as Mario Kart 64, and they finally went through with it. And yes, I know he was in tour, that's why I specifically said console Mario Kart game. But then there was the final batch, which gave us Peachette, Pauline, Funky Kong, and at long last, they finally brought back Diddy Kong. Like, it feels weird that it had been so long. Last time Diddy showed up in a console Mario Kart game was Mario Kart Wii in 2008. That's a 15 year time gap. But finally, he's back, and that alone made the booster course pass worth it for me. Okay, not quite, but even still, the Booster Course Pass was an overall great addition to an already solid Mario Kart, and playing it was definitely one of my gaming highlights in 2023. Okay, to start this segment off, let's quickly address something. So chances are, if you haven't played this game before, you've probably heard of it through this clip that circulated when it came out. Did, hang on, did you just shift reality? Now I will note, this style of writing isn't super prominent throughout the game. In fact, the character responsible for it is largely absent from the game after the first world. But that said, despite that, I will fully admit that I wasn't big on the story and writing of Viewfinder. The game's plot focuses on an expedition through an old simulation world set up by scientists years ago, who were using it to research a way to restore plant life on Earth, as the Earth no longer has flora and is suffering the consequences for it. Throughout your time in the simulation, you find recordings of conversations and data logs from the scientists, and I don't know, I just never really felt that invested in these characters, and the crisis they're solving honestly didn't feel that prominent throughout the game, despite the extremity of it. The main gameplay gimmick didn't even really tie into their research all too much either. Though with that said, this is a favorite games of the year list, and while the narrative aspect didn't really keep my interest, the same cannot be said about the gameplay. Viewfinder is a logic puzzle game, with its main gameplay hook being around using pictures to alter reality. You pick up a picture, hold it up, and boom, everything in that picture is now physical and interactable. So speaking from a technical standpoint, this blew my mind. Because it's not like the game has specific scripted outcomes with these, it gives you full creative freedom over where you can place these pictures, and thus where these objects end up. And it's not always just the objects you see, sometimes the placed picture brings an entire new environment into reality but it's especially apparent once you're further into the game and you're given your own camera, giving you the power to take a picture of almost anything in the game and place it down almost anywhere in the environment. I don't even want to imagine how convoluted the coding for the system ended up getting, my goodness. That said, pulling off something this impressive on a technical standpoint doesn't automatically make a game good, but fortunately, Viewfinder is a pretty engaging puzzle game. It follows a similar structure to puzzle games like Portal, one of the game's main inspirations, with you going from room to room completing puzzles of varying challenge to get to the level's end. And while I do think some of Viewfinder's puzzles kinda just go through the motions with the mechanics it's introduced, it does still have some interesting ideas and solutions throughout. One of my personal favorites was later on in the game, where you're introduced to these doorways that change the visual filter on the world around you, with certain parts of the environment only being there with specific visual filters. But the interesting thing is that when you walk through a doorway, the filter you previously had is now the one attached to said doorway. Meaning if you were to walk through it again, you'd swap back. This led to a pretty solid puzzle about aligning the doorways and their filters to get past all these different filtered barriers to the exit on a timer. That was fun to figure out. 
Another favorite later on is this one here. The level end teleporter is powered by a scale with a watermelon on it. It only charges halfway, so clearly you need a second watermelon. You don't have your camera for this level, but there's a viewfinder camera set up that can't be moved, facing a slope. Obviously, you want to put the watermelon on the slope and take a picture of it to duplicate it, but it's a slope. That watermelon ain't staying still. On top of that, the area is entirely made of this purple material that's not duplicated in the pictures taken, so you can't alter the environment to your favor. So what do you do? Admittedly, I actually ended up looking this one up because I got stumped, but even then, the solution was genius. Placing a picture won't affect the environment, but it will still affect the watermelon. So you take a picture of the skyline, and use the picture to slice the watermelon, allowing you to place it on the slope without it sliding down, and then using the viewfinder picture to duplicate the watermelon. Like I said earlier, I feel like some of viewfinder's puzzles do kinda just go through the motions, but when it does have you think outside the box, it's quite engaging. Even in the occasions that I ended up having to look up solutions, bear in mind, I'm not the best at these kind of puzzle games, I never had that feeling of, how was I supposed to figure that out? It was always, oh, that's clever. So yeah, while I wasn't huge on how it handled the story it wanted to tell, I did overall quite enjoy my time with Viewfinder. If you're wanting a new logic puzzle game similar to that of Portal, this ain't a bad option. To be honest, I've previously been on the fence about whether or not I include remaster-style remakes on my Games of the Year lists. For those who don't know what I mean by that, I'm referring to game remakes that are done in, well, the style of a remaster, where they follow the same structure as the original, but with remade assets, quality of life improvements here and there, and occasionally some new content on top of that. Think stuff like the Insane Trilogy, or the recent Mario RPG remake. Unlike something like FF7 Remake or the Resident Evil remakes, which take their source material and reimagine them, these kind of remakes by design stick incredibly closely to their source material. And because of that, I've been conflicted on whether I should consider them or not for these lists. Previously, the criteria I set for myself was that the remaster style remake either had to add enough to the experience that it felt like it had grown into its own game, such as CTR Nitro Fueled, or the remake was the first time the game had been localized, which is what allowed the Live Alive remake to be on my 2022 list. Story of Seasons A Wonderful Life doesn't do either of those. The original game came out in North America in 2004, and while there have been some changes and additions in the remake, it's largely the same experience as the original. So what makes Story of Seasons A Wonderful Life qualify then? Simple. I really enjoyed it. For context, the original game, Harvest Moon A Wonderful Life, is one of my personal favorite games, and has been my favorite farming game since I was little. I really liked Forget-Me-Not Valley and its various residents, especially with the game's unique inclusion of actual time progression. So you and the residents get older with each chapter, and the friendships you choose to make playing a part in deciding your child's future as your child also gets older. It all gave that extra feeling of humanity to the cast. And even beyond that, I found playing it to be oddly relaxing, even in the mundaneness of taking taking care of your crops and animals. I know many are more partial towards Friends of Mineral Town, and I like that one too, but I was always more of a Wonderful Life fan as a kid. So when it was announced in the September 2022 Nintendo Direct that Wonderful Life was getting a remake, I was excited to say the least. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on, is this... Oh my goodness, what?! Ah! Sure enough, a lot of what got me to love the original carried over to the remake, which I suppose is to be expected for a remaster-style remake, but we have seen in the past how some of these kind of games have made elements worse from their originals. But just about everything in Wonderful Life's case is either maintained or improved. Stuff like a Stardew Valley-esque bulletin board to fulfill requests for the townsfolk, additions to the game's romance system, including a new marriage scene which was really cute, full character customization, and relating to that, FINALLY, the guys can wear different outfits. That was something only the girl variant game Another Wonderful Life had back in the day. The guy was stuck in the same outfit for the whole game, but not anymore! Now granted, with how much the farming genre has changed and evolved since the GameCube days, one could argue that this game's a bit behind in the times, a sentiment shared by many critics when the remake came out. And yeah, I will admit, compared to something like Stardew Valley, the Wonderful Life remake is perhaps a bit stuck in the past. So is it being on the list partly due to nostalgia bias? No. It's largely due to nostalgia bias. It was just really nice to be able to play a longtime favorite, now on the Switch with all these new features and touch-ups. Like having a favorite comfort food meal with a couple extra ingredients that make it taste even better. Sure, not everyone will enjoy it like you do, but that's okay. The one thing I'm still having to get used to with the remake, though, is the new names. 
I'm not sure if this was a localization thing or due to the Harvest Moon rights issues. For context, the Harvest Moon devs and publishers split a few years ago and the publisher kept the Harvest Moon name. That's why the series is called Story of Seasons now. But point is, I'm so used to the character and area names from the original that adjusting to some of these new names has been difficult. Like Celia now being Cecilia, sure, I like that, it's cute. But Forget-Me-Not Valley now being called Forgotten Valley? Well, first off, that's literally the opposite of the original name. Plus, you lose the reference to the Forget-Me-Not Flower. And Forget-Me-Not Valley is just a more standout name than Forgotten Valley. But I'll stop with the tangent there. I've talked about this before in videos, but man, I've been loving this era of indie 3D platformers. Ever since A Hat in Time hit the scene, we've been seeing a rise in indie 3D platformers being made, and as a big fan of both indie games and 3D platformers, I feel like I've been spoiled lately. We got more of them this past year, but there were three titles in particular that stood out. A trio of indie 3D platformers, specifically aiming to capture the look and feel of the N64 era. I played all three of these games, and spoilers, they're all on the list, but we'll get to the other two later. For now, we'll focus on just one of them, that being Corn Kid 64. So while it's ranked the lowest out of the three, I will immediately say that, in my opinion at least, this one captures the N64 style the best out of them. From the environment aesthetic to the character movement to the sound design, Corn Kid 64 nails the N64 look and feel. And while the other two do amazing jobs capturing that as well, playing this game felt the most like I was playing a lost N64 game on an emulator. Shoutouts to Bogo for pulling that off as well as they did. But even beyond the perfectly executed aesthetic, Corn Kid 64 is a pretty fun time all around. The story is pretty nonsensical, focusing on these two goat kids named Sevi and Alexis within a dream realm. In particular, a recurring dream Sevi's been having about a nacho emporium. Alexis has been trying to break him free of this, but Sevi really just wants his nachos. And in his attempt to obtain them, the two get entangled in the ongoings of Wallows Hollow, a town of pig people that's been taken over by evil owls. And only in defeating the owls can Sevi access what Alexis calls the Realm of Infinite Nachos. Like I said, it's a pretty nonsensical story Story, but one that's fully aware of the fact. The game in general has some rather fun writing, with several parts getting a good laugh out of me. As for the gameplay itself though, Corn Kids goes for a mix of free roaming platformer like Banjo Kazooie and more linear challenge based platformer. After that initial tutorial level, you'll spend a majority of your time wandering around Wallows Hollow with a whole bunch of tasks to complete, all bringing you one step closer to getting rid of the owls. Some of these tasks, I will admit, took some trial and error to figure out, but I don't recall any being outright annoying to work through, and Sevi's moveset plays a part in that. Sevi feels quite good to control, with a large emphasis being put on that horn of his. You can use it in a multitude of ways, such as digging, homing attack specific objects, latching onto stuff, and spinning while latched on, both to use mechanisms and remove screws. The game does a lot with what seems like a simple moveset on the surface, which is made especially apparent in these special challenge rooms and those more linear challenge based levels, the final tower level especially. Also, this game does something interesting with its collectibles. You primarily collect XP, and with enough XP, you level up. Instead of leveling up going into something like stats though, being a higher level allows you to access more areas in each of the levels, with a bonus final level for getting up to level 5. I never got to level 5 myself, but seeing footage of what that bonus final level has to offer, that might have been for the best. It's a unique fusion of a level up system with collectathon traits, and really incentivizes going out of your way to do everything you can to collect XP. Now I will note that, while I've made it known in the past that I appreciate a nice short game, something about Corn Kid 64 did leave me wanting more. Maybe it's because the only free roaming level in the game is Wallow's Hollow, and I went in assuming there'd be like one or two more levels like that, though as I since found out, the Steam page goes over this, so that's on me. But even despite that, what is here makes for a solid time. And if you've got an itch for a new 3D platformer that feels like it came right off the N64, Corn Kid 64 will definitely give you that. Side note, you are actually able to play this game in widescreen and with HD visuals, but like, nah, this doesn't feel right. Something I love about indie games in general is how often they'll end up filling gaps of interest that the AAA side of the industry doesn't like to tackle as much anymore. But what's even more fun is when an indie game ends up scratching an itch you didn't even notice was there initially. Like, prior to 2023, I wasn't actively craving a swashbuckler action game in the vein of something like Zorro or The Princess Bride, but then in comes Fireplace Games with their indie title Unguard to provide exactly that, and I'm very happy that they did. 
Originally a student project released on itch.io back in 2018, the student team came together to expand their little graduation project into a full game, which saw released this past August. Now I previously wasn't familiar with the student project myself, so I can't really compare how this fares with the original, but even still, this is quite a fun and very charming little adventure. It focuses on the endeavors of Adalia the Volador, a Robin Hood-esque vigilante who fights for the people against the tyranny and schemes of the evil mustache-twirling Count Duke. Though she's not alone in her adventure, Adventures. She's got allies in the form of her brother, I mean, the mysterious and charismatic El Vigilante, and the animatic pirate lady Zaida. But even on her own, Adalia is a force to be reckoned with against the Count Duke's forces. And by that, I mean she usually leaves the Count Duke's soldiers feeling humiliated. There's a reason I use the Princess Bride as one of my points of comparison, because the game's got a lot of that same comedic fun to it. It's not quite a laugh-out-loud comedy, but the witty dialogue and banter always kept a smile on my face throughout. I lost the bet. Sorry to hear that. Don't mess with me. I have an arsenal at my back. Hmm. Thanks, Rosetti. They say I have a fighting addiction. Ha! Sounds more like they have a chickening out addiction. Luckily, in tight spots like this, I always manage to find a conveniently hidden exit. Oh no! She found the conveniently hidden exit again. Remember, you should never stand in front of it. I also use The Princess Bride as a point of comparison, because the game actually has several references to it throughout. Don't think I didn't hear that from back there. Who do you think you are? My name is Natalia de Volador. You ransacked my city. Prepare to be beaten very severely. The shenanigans aren't limited to just the dialogue, though, because the swashbuckling translates the gameplay really well in Unguard, both in the swordplay and everything surrounding it. Literally. The swordplay mechanics are pretty simple, with enemies having attacks that can be parried and some that require dodging, but with how it's executed, mindless button mashing will very rarely result in victory. Finesse and panache are important aspects of any sword fight in a swashbuckler, and that's definitely reflected in how Unguard sword fighting plays out. However, this style of combat is better suited to one-on-one -on -one fights, not ones where you're surrounded, which you often are in this game. Which leads to the other main element behind Unguard shenanigans, using the environment. Like in many good swashbucklers, one's surroundings are often the key to victory, and that's put to full use in Unguard. Most battle scenarios will have many ways to interact with the environment, all being usable against your opponents as a means to control the crowd and keep yourself one step ahead of your foes. Setting off cannons, throwing buckets on enemies' heads to temporarily leave them confused, launching off a pot so it can comically come back down and knock out one of the soldiers instantly, the game very much encourages experimenting with the set pieces to clear out enemies, and it makes for a really delightful gameplay loop. And all this is with a vibrant and colorful art style that fits perfectly with the more light-hearted, adventurous tone of the story and gameplay. And you'll see plenty of it as you climb and platform about the environments in between fights. Though granted, the environments you get are rather limited, as the game's only four levels long and three of them are set within the same town. Which yeah, like with Corn Kid 64, Unguard's short length did leave me wanting more. The game does have an arena mode alongside the main story at least, but yeah, I do kinda wish the campaign was a bit longer. Doesn't help that the final level had a couple of annoying encounters with multiple enemies that require more dedicated effort to make vulnerable, and with how the game's combat is structured, getting swarmed by multiple enemies like this can be kind of a pain. But even still, despite my criticisms, Unguard is a delightful little adventure, and if you've been craving some swashbuckling action in video game form, you'll likely have a fun time with this. So you know how for April Fools, game companies will often make fake announcements, and how often people are left wishing the announcement was real? Well, I think some companies are picking up on that, because lately we've started seeing game companies making crazy announcements on April Fools that actually turn out to be real. Case in point, a point-and-click murder mystery visual novel set in the Sonic universe. The fact that this ended up being a real game, let alone one that was released for free, still leaves me flabbergasted. But you certainly won't see me complaining. Though, that was likely obvious, given that it made it this far onto my Games of 2023 list, but the point still stands. It's Amy's birthday, and she's invited several of the series' cast onto the Mirage Express for a murder mystery party. And as the train's newest, and really only employee, it's up to you to tag along with Tails, the most adorable detective ever, in solving the case of who killed Sonic. Okay, yeah, so it's not an actual murder, but there's a fun mystery to uncover regardless. It's a pretty simple and straightforward point-and-click mystery game, certainly not going to be messing with your head compared to more complex titles in the genre, but what ultimately makes this game so enjoyable for me is the characters and how they're written. 
I'm sure I've gone over this before, but speaking personally, I've got a lot more of a nostalgic connection with the 2000s era of Sonic than the Genesis era or 2010s era, so I grew up with the games and media that were jam-packed with Sonic's various friendos. And I know their presence was a point of contention for a long time, but I do really like the series' ensemble cast. So a game like this where a major focus is the character interactions immediately clicked with me. Several of these characters don't get used a whole ton anymore in the mainline titles, so giving them a chance to shine like this, let alone in a generally more casual scenario, was really great to see. And it helps that the writing is consistently on point, both in capturing each character's well, character, and in its humor. Like, this game's got some really funny interactions all throughout, particular highlights including a fiasco regarding a Super Monkey Ball arcade cabinet, hectically trying to figure out what to do with an active time bomb, and an ongoing saga with your player character and trash bins. But yeah, you can definitely feel the love and understanding the writers of this project have for the series' cast of characters, which, given this game was primarily developed by the Sonic social media team, that makes a lot of sense. And it makes for a very entertaining little story to play through. I also wasn't expecting it to get a bit heartfelt during the finale, but that is indeed a surprise the game throws at you. Oh, actually, quick suggestion on that note. Playing this game with friends watching is an especially fun time. I screen shared my playthrough in a Discord call, and we all had a blast. Also thanks to this game, we've discovered some very integral new lore bits. Namely, Amochow's Wanted for Medical Malpractice. It's funny, I remember seeing some people react to the reveal of F-Zero 99 with stuff like, oh, the F-Zero fans are gonna be mad, or I'm so sorry, F-Zero fans. And true, I have seen some fans be upset or disappointed by this direction. But that said, as a longtime F-Zero fan myself, nah, I was on board with this right from the get-go. The last time we got any kind of F-Zero game prior to this was in 2004. We've been waiting almost 20 years for a new F-Zero game. And sure, an entirely brand new F-Zero game would have been preferred but you know what? I'll take what I can get. Plus, F-Zero's always had some form of elimination system since the very first game, and heck, F-Zero X straight up had a Battle Royale-esque mode in the form of Death Race, so F-Zero getting a full-on Battle Royale game just makes sense to me. So yeah, I'll happily accept this take on the series, and it helps that the execution on the concept was pretty solid. F-Zero 99 uses the original SNES game's aesthetic and lineup of tracks and vehicles, but actually plays quite a bit differently from the SNES game, and not just from it having a ton more racers. It incorporates several mechanics from later F-Zero games, such as the spin attack and the boost system introduced in F-Zero X, where your health and boost are the same meter. Thus, you're given that same high-risk, high-reward feel that the later games were built around. How much do you rely on the boost when it's also costing you health and putting you at risk of blowing up? Though new to this game is a super boost system. By collecting super sparks from actively colliding into other racers, you can fill up a meter that, when full, takes you up to an alternate Skyway track where you can get some significant speed and get ahead of several competitors. Thus, it's another element to consider in the risk and reward sort of way, as bumping into your opposition will, obviously, also drain health. So how much do you risk playing aggressively for the chance of getting up to the Skyway? So yeah, despite looking like just the SNES F-Zero game with a whole lot of racers, it's actually more like an amalgamation of the original game with the additions the later games had made, all wrapped up in a competitive Battle Royale format. And I think it results in a really fun F-Zero experience. It also helps that, while I prefer the later games, the SNES original was my first, and for a while, only F-Zero game, so I'm pretty used to how it plays. Thus, I got the hang of 99 pretty quickly. Granted, I've only managed to get first place twice in my time with this game, but eh, minor detail. Now I will note that the game launched with not a lot of content and took a bit to get some more, and even now with all the tracks from the SNES game patched in, I can't help but wonder where they plan on taking the game from here. Like, are they gonna make new tracks, or just finish off support there? I have no idea. But whatever the future holds for F-099, and F-Zero as a whole, it's nice that we got SOMETHING new from this series after so long, and something that was a blast to play. And here we have the second of that trio of N64-style indie 3D platformers. Some of you may recall that I actually did a gameplay showcase of this game's demo at the start of last year, and I had a pleasant time with the demo back then. Well, the full game launched this past October, which the developer Binon gave me a Steam key for. Thank you very much for that, I greatly appreciate it. And as I suspected it would, Cavern of Dreams as a full game was also a pleasant time. 
The game has you playing as this adorable little dragon guy named Finn, whose unhatched baby siblings were abducted and taken into, well, the Cavern of Dreams, which he enters to find them. Along the way, he gets the assistance of Cavern resident Sage, who's able to grant him new abilities as he finds more of his siblings, alongside other NPCs in the various worlds he explores within the cavern. Though he also finds himself at odds with Luna, the mischievous bat girl behind the egg napping. Without going into spoilers, she's got a lot she's working through, which she's unfortunately taking out on poor innocent Finn and his family. But Finn's a resilient one, and nothing's going to stop him from getting his siblings to safety. The siblings in question are your main collectible in this collectathon adventure, which follows the subgenre's general formula of exploring open sandbox environments to find collectibles. Though in Cabin of Dreams' case, it leans a lot more into exploration, platforming, and puzzle solving than it does combat. In fact, it doesn't have combat at all. You do get a tail swipe early on, but outside of a single encounter with the Mighty Wall, which even the result of that changed from the demo, with the Mighty Wall now just falling over instead of becoming a ghost, that tail swipe's gonna be for hitting switches and breaking things, rather than attacking any enemies. As such, Cabin of Dreams leans more into making its environments feel very atmospheric, and it really nails that. From the cozy warmth and autumn colors of Lost Leaf Lake, to the initially chilled, turned peacefully snowy feel of Prismic Palace, to the ominous and creepy Gallery of Nightmares, each area captures the tone it's going for pretty much flawlessly, and helps that exploring these levels are pretty fun to do. For the most part, Gallery Nightmares admittedly got kinda tedious to get through. Though what helps make it so fun is Finn himself. He starts off with very little, primarily a simple jump and the ability to roll, which greatly increases your speed even once you return to running normally. But as I said earlier, Sage grants him new abilities as he collects more of his siblings, such as the previously mentioned tail swipe, wings to glide with, a horn to ground pound with, water breath, and even full flight once you've collected all the eggs in the game. And with many of these abilities come not only the basic utility, but other benefits. For example, tail swiping the ground right as you're about to land to get some extra forward momentum. And all this is accompanied with an incredibly pleasant art style all throughout. I know I said earlier that Corn Kid 64 nails the N64 look and feel the best out of the trio, but that's not to undersell how Cavern of Dreams adapts it whatsoever. This game takes the N64 aesthetic and makes some visually wonderful environments out of it. And that's without even mentioning the music. Benjamin Keckley did a superb job with the game's soundtrack, with my favorite piece by far being Lost Leaf Lake. It's such a beautifully pleasant song that helps a lot in giving the level its cozy feel, and I've actively listened to it on my own time while working on multiple occasions since the game came out. Now granted, this game's not without its hiccups. As I said earlier, Gallery of Nightmares got kind of tedious, and some obstacles and challenges got a bit irritating to deal with here and there. But generally speaking, I really enjoyed my time with Cabin of Dreams. Great work here, By9. You've got a very charming little game here. You have no idea how happy I am that this game exists. I don't talk about it a ton here, but I'm actually quite a fan of old school color matching puzzle games. You know, stuff like Dr. Mario, Puzzle League, Puyo Puyo, though my favorite of those has always been Puzzle Bobble, or Bust a Move as it was known in North America up until a few years ago. More specifically, I'm a big fan of the original games from the 90s, with Bust a Move 4 being my personal favorite. 4 in particular took the simple but satisfying gameplay loop of the series and expanded on it in ways that made it utterly crazy to play in the best way possible. <laughs> However, for a long while after that, the series wasn't doing all too good. I played a majority of the series' titles a little while back for reasons I won't elaborate on, and I'm gonna be honest, a majority of the games after Bust a Move 4 aren't great. Whether it be trying to reinvent its gameplay identity in ways that didn't need to be reinvented, or lacking the snappiness, speed, and energy that made those original games as good as they were, the series as a whole just wasn't nearly as good as it used to be. After 2011, the series took a decade-long hiatus, barring a couple mobile games, before making its return in 2021 with Puzzle Bobble Vacation Odyssey, which was just kinda okay. It changed up the gameplay style a ton to accommodate for it being a VR game, which I'm sure made for a good VR experience, but for its non-VR counterpart, it wasn't too spectacular. But finally, FINALLY, we've got another actually good Puzzle Bobble game this past year in the form of Puzzle Bobble Every Bubble. And not even just good, but like, really good. It goes back to the traditional style of the original games, with that same snappiness, speed, and energy that those older titles had, but interestingly, it doesn't just copy-paste the original game systems and call it a day. It actually does incorporate some of the ideas introduced in later titles, but refines them in a way that builds on and benefits the gameplay formula, rather than feeling gimmicky or intrusive. 
the power-ups, for example. It was an idea that was toyed with previously, but it felt too much like a gimmick and not like something that benefited the gameplay. Every bubble, however, finds a way to incorporate it more naturally into the flow of play and make the power-ups actually feel useful. Even something as simple as the bubble swap system got enhanced. In some of the previous games, you were able to keep a bubble store that you could swap to if need be, but it was a largely ignorable feature in most cases. Every bubble alters it so that instead of swapping out a stored bubble, you swap between your current bubble and your next bubble. This makes the flow of play, well, flow better in my opinion. And I found myself actively using it a lot more than previous games swap systems. and it helps that every bubble's puzzles are consistently fun to overcome, even as they get trickier and trickier. Especially so with every bubble bringing back the star rating system from Vacation Odyssey. Beating the level in a certain time will determine your star rating, so it becomes a fun challenge to complete the level as quickly and efficiently as possible. And with the return to that speedy, snappy feel that the series was known for, it makes the process all the more satisfying. And that's before mentioning the Challenge Tower, where you're tested to see just how long you can last in an endless scroll of a puzzle, or the multiplayer. Past games have traditionally had 1v1 multiplayer, with a couple of games trying to experiment with including more players than that. Busted Move Bash on the Wii, for example, had support for up to 8 players. Every bubble decided to experiment with the multiplayer a bit too, and I think it handled it pretty well. You're able to have up to 4 players for story mode co-op, with the level size accommodating for the number of players, and from experience with my sisters, it's pretty fun. Not as fun as the versus mode though, where you can play either traditional 1v1, or 2v2. My sisters and I had a blast with the 2v2 versus mode. It's frantic and chaotic and oh so much fun. Helps that every bubble leans into an old series tradition of having a colorful cast of playable characters. In this game's case, you interact with each of the characters in the story mode, giving them more presence and personality, and there's a nice variety of both classic characters from previous games and new ones that fit in well with the old. Biggest surprise of the roster though was the presence of Katsi, the main boss character of the Super Bust Move game. For context, the Super Busted Move games tried to do a complete refresh of the game's visual style and character lineup, which didn't end up working, so I'm surprised they brought back anyone from this era. But I'll give them credit for taking this otherwise forgettable character and making him one of my favorites in this series. Seriously, he went from this... It is easy. ...to this. Oh yeah, and there's also a Puzzle Bobble meets Space Invaders multiplayer mode, which is a neat little addition, and online play. Haven't had a chance to try the online admittedly, but hey, it's an option. But yeah, point of the matter is, Puzzle Bobble Every Bubble was a great return to form for the series. And I am so happy that we finally have another really good game in this franchise. You know, with Square Enix's recent track record with not great revivals of classic Final Fantasy spin-off titles, between 2018's Decidia NT and 2022's Chocobo GP, before they re-released it and took out the microtransactions, it's relieving to see that Theater Rhythm didn't follow suit. Then again, I never owned the original Theater Rhythm on 3DS, and while I did own its sequel Curtain Call, I didn't play a whole lot of it. So maybe I'm just cursed to get bad sequels to the spin-offs I'm invested in. Which now means the NEXT Theater Rhythm game's gonna suck, so I apologize in advance. But yeah, my experience with these games was minimal when I got around to Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line. But hey, I like rhythm games, I like Final Fantasy, and I especially like Final Fantasy's music, so I was expecting this to go well. Needless to say, given its placement on this list, it went really well. Final Bar Line follows the same gameplay style as the previous 3DS installments, with notes to hit and hold and slide along with, all alongside a party of Final Fantasy characters as they explore a field area or partake in battles, as you rhythm game your way through the franchise's many classic tunes. Now with this being the first theater rhythm game on console, changes were made to accommodate for the lack of 3DS touchscreen. Fortunately, there was an already existing theater rhythm arcade game, so this game used that as a basis. And I think it made the jump to controller format quite well. It's a really satisfying take on rhythm gameplay, and I continuously find it fun to play, even if it's just in short bursts. Now I will admit on that note, I think the game's RPG elements don't feel that crucial? Like, your party members level up and gain new equipable abilities, you've got a bunch of summons to pick from to use in battle, there's potions and other consumable items to assist your party in the battles they're partaking in while you rhythm along, but unless you're aiming to complete all the extra quests in each level, which are optional and just unlock stuff like in-game art and costumes for your party's Moogle companion, a lot of the RPG elements here I admittedly found largely ignorable. 
However, I suppose that doesn't change just how much fun the core gameplay is, and while the specifics of it I felt didn't matter, it was still fun to watch my team of adorably sized Final Fantasy characters duke it out with various monsters and bosses while I played, so I suppose it's not a huge drawback in the grand scheme of things. The game's charm is definitely apparent in its cute aesthetic, which combined with the addictive gameplay and massive track list makes the experience an overall worthwhile one. Which on that note, let's get to that track list. So I do think there is a bit of favoritism towards some games compared to others. Just using the MMO tiles as an example, Final Fantasy XI has 21 songs in this game, while Final Fantasy XIV has 33. And some rather iconic songs were made strangely exclusive to the Digital Deluxe Edition, even in their good games, Square Enix's questionable business decisions can't always be avoided. But generally speaking, Final Barline has a really strong lineup of tunes spanning the entire franchise. From the mainline titles and their direct sequels, to spin-offs like Tactics, Crystal Chronicles, and Dissidia, to official covers from other media, such as the Black Mage's rock covers and the Smash Ultimate FF7 remixes, to even music from other Square Enix titles like Chrono Trigger, Live Alive, The World Ends With You, Nier Automata. There was a lot of fantastic music in this game, and it's a lineup that they only continued to expand post-launch. For instance, they added Final Fantasy 16 music to this game. That said, do not underestimate this game, because my goodness, it's not afraid to give a sucker punch of difficulty when it feels like it. I spend a majority of my time on this game on the game's equivalent to normal difficulty, the second difficulty out of four, and while I was able to get along just fine for most of it, some of these songs even on normal difficulty get nuts. I spent 40 minutes on this arrangement of Battle on the Big Bridge, which was crazy enough as is, but then I decided just to watch what the same song on the hardest difficulty is like, and just look at this! My brain hurts just watching this. But yeah, overall, I had a really fun time with Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line. Sure, a good chunk of its systems I felt were kind of just there, but the core rhythm gameplay and the cute aesthetic definitely won me over. And many of my sessions with this game ended up going way longer than I was initially intending. Not that I'm complaining. Given the whole trio of N64 indie platformers thing I've had going on in this video, I'm sure some of you guessed that this was going to show up on the list at some point. Well, if you did, you guessed correctly. Because out of these three games, Pseudoregalia was definitely my favorite. Like with Unguard earlier, this actually first started as a smaller project. In this game's case, it was made in three weeks for a Metroidvania-themed game jam, which it ended up winning. But the developer, Ritzler, decided to expand it into a full game with the help of some friends. Which yeah, quick side note, contrary to popular belief, Pseudoregalia was not a solo dev game. Ritzler was the lead dev on it, yes, but he didn't make the game all by himself. In fact, the lead dev of the previously mentioned Vernal Edge worked on this game too, doing the environment textures and a third of the level design, just to name one example. But yeah, the project got expanded and released as a full game this past summer, and it did not take long for it to get a following among the indie platformer community. Pseudoregalia takes the idea of being an N64 3D platformer and goes a very different direction with it than many others, and for the most part, I think it nails what it was going for. There's a couple areas where it admittedly doesn't, but we'll get there when we get there. So while games like Cavern of Dreams and Corn Kids 64 follow the more traditional N64 platformer format, Pseudoregalia instead is more like a fusion of N64 platformer with N64 adventure game, having you explore this giant multi-section castle in a Metroidvania fashion, but with a platform platformer-esque moveset. And what a moveset it is! Pseudoregalia has already seen a lot of praise for just how expansive and enjoyable the moveset from main character Sybil is, with many calling it one of the best of any 3D platformer. And, well, I'm inclined to agree. You start with very little at the beginning of the game, but the more you find new abilities, the more creative freedom you're given for moving around the environment. Nitrorad did a fantastic breakdown of the moveset in his review of the game, if you want a more detailed explanation of all the movement options. But yeah, this is easily some of the most fun I've had with just moving a character around in a 3D platformer. From slide jumps, to backflips, to wall slides, to ground pounds into high jumps, to one of the trickiest but also best wall kick systems in the genre, there's a lot to work with. And the level design is built in a way that pulling off crazy skips with what you have is not only possible, but encouraged. Sure, you could use these bubbles that give you an extra jump to get across this exceedingly large gap, or you could ground stomp into a high jump, and then use your limited wall kicks to make your way up the wall at the end of the gap. Or like this part here, you could do this puzzle as intended, or you could slide jump across to the end, wall kick your way onto the lower platform, 
and then ground pound into a high jump to get to the higher platform where the key is. And frankly, this is just scratching the surface of the kind of insane stuff you can pull off in this game. Seriously, speedruns of Pseudo Regalia are already nuts. And it's only been out for like, half a year so far. I can only imagine how crazy it'll be by the time the game's a year old. And all this is coupled with a world that's oozing with atmosphere. A somber and ominous dream world that largely lacks living presence. Sure, you'll come across some little goat NPCs here and there, but not super often. And any of the creatures you encounter in this castle will not be so friendly. The combat is admittedly very simple, but I didn't mind it too much myself, since not a lot of focus is really put on combat encounters in the game. Something I did mind though, and the one part that I think might turn some people away from the game, was just how easy it was to get lost. Like I said earlier, this is a Metroidvania, but without any kind of map system. There is one currently in the works, but at the time of me recording this, that update hasn't been finished yet. And because of that, you'll often find yourself wandering in circles trying to figure out where on earth to go next, not helped by how samey some of the rooms look. I do think this becomes less of an issue the more you unlock new abilities, since even just getting around from place to place is made more fun, but until that point, it can get tedious trying to figure out where you're supposed to go next. And when you do figure it out, trying to remember how to get there. And to clarify, I don't want games like this or Vernal Edge to handhold me and show me exactly where I need to go at all times. If I wanted that, I'd play a lot more AAA games. But yeah, I'm sure you get what I mean. That said, despite the lack of direction, it's still really fun to explore these areas, largely thanks to the movement options you have at your disposal. And because of that, I had a really great time with Pseudo Regalia. It's also like, dirt cheap? Only costing about $7 here in Canada. So I think it's worth giving a go. And with that, we've now reached the end of this video's N64 styled indie 3D platformer saga. So how's about we start talking about some 2D platformers? I'd have to go back and double check, but out of all the games that came out in 2023, I think this might be the one people requested me to talk about the most. It was either this or Hi-Fi Rush. All throughout the year, I got comments and replies asking if I had played Pizza Tower, asking what I thought about Pizza Tower, asking if I was going to review Pizza Tower. Well, I did indeed play Pizza Tower, I'm about to share what I thought about it, and I guess in a roundabout way, this segment could count as me reviewing it. So there we go, hitting all the requests in one go. Okay, joking aside, I really enjoyed my time with Pizza Tower. Right out the gate, the game's art style hooked me. This sort of 90s cartoon meets MS Paint look really stood out for me. And while I can't pinpoint a specific game it reminds me of, the visual style in general gave me a sort of 90s PC game era feel to it, and I really like that. Helps that the developers went above and beyond with the expressiveness and personality of the animations, with our main character Peppino Spaghetti being in a special highlight. Seriously, the number of animations he has just for his regular state of play is insane. And that's before mentioning all the various transformations, but I'm getting ahead of myself. For those who may be unaware, Pizza Tower is a 2D platformer about, well, Peppino Spaghetti. A pizza chef with a struggling pizzeria who's confronted by Pizza Face, a sentient pizza that plans to blast Peppino's pizzeria off the face of the earth just for the sake of it. Feeling both scared and furious, Peppino books it to Pizza Face's lair, the Pizza Tower, to put a stop to this plan of his before it's too late. It's a pretty nonsensical story, and uses the word pizza a whole lot, but hey, it fits just how nonsensical the game as a whole gets. With gameplay directly inspired by the Wario Land games, you're going to find yourself traversing the many wacky rooms the tower has to offer, such as a golf course, a Five Nights at Freddy's homage, a farm containing legendary PS1 platformer character Mort the Chicken, and war. Just... war. Every level throws a ton of crazy ideas at the wall, and 9 times out of 10, they end up sticking solidly. Whether it be with the hazards, or the transformations Peppino goes through that change up how you handle any given situation. Or heck, sometimes playing as another character altogether. But even playing as just plain old Peppino is an absolute blast, thanks to the multitude of moves at his disposal and his absolutely manic levels of speed. You're able to go real fast as Peppino, and mastering Peppino at top speed, while figuring out the most efficient means to get through a level at said speed, is key. Far from easy, but oh so satisfying to do so. Especially if you're able to keep that action combo going by picking up key items and taking out enemies before that combo meter plummets. It's a really fun gameplay loop, and that's all before or getting to pizza time. Pretty much every level ends with this segment, requiring you to book it back to the start of the level before Pizza Face shows up to chase you down. But if you want to strive for higher letter ranks, especially the fabled P rank, you're going to have to push your luck and pull off the pizza time segment twice under a single time limit. Getting a P rank especially is nuts, requiring you to find all level secrets, 
do a second lap of pizza time, all with a high enough score, all without ever letting your combo drop for the entire level. Not counting the bosses, where getting a P rank is as simple as beating them without ever getting hit, I've only ever gotten a P rank on a level once in my entire time with this game, that being on the first level. And that process alone took two hours to pull off. Was it worth it though? Oh, absolutely. Not enough for me to try and get P ranks on the other levels, granted, but it felt nice to know that I was able to pull it off at least once. I did go for P ranks on the bosses though, and while they're a fair bit more simple compared to the main levels, it's a whole different story if you're aiming to beat them without ever taking a hit. And even then, you've got some pretty fun and memorable fights here, with the biggest highlight of the bosses being the end fight against Pizza Face. I won't spoil why that's the case, I don't want to ruin that surprise, but believe me when I say, this game absolutely knows how to end on a high note. But yeah, all in all, Pizza Tower was an incredibly fun time. And the best part is, there's still more to come. The developers are currently in the midst of adding The Noise, one of the game's bosses, as a playable character, which is really cool. Oh right, I forgot to mention this earlier. I'm not sticking to the one per franchise rule for this list. Whoops. But yeah, Mario Wonder was something special. For context, while I do like the 2D Mario games overall, they're not my preferred games in the series. If given the option, I'd likely prioritize a 3D Mario game or one of the many spin-off titles. The one exception though is Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island if you want to count that as a Mario game. Mario World is not just one of my favorite Mario games, it's also one of my favorite 2D platformers. From the inclusion of stuff like Yoshi and the Cape Feather, still my favorite power-up in the series, to the emphasis on secrets throughout the game, to just the generally creative ideas all throughout, it's a game I've played through more times than I can count. And while elements of that experience carried over to future 2D Mario games, the later 2D Mario games as a whole generally felt like they followed more in Mario 3's footsteps. Which isn't a bad thing, Mario 3 is a beloved title, but as someone who preferred World over Mario 3, I did kind of hope we could get something like it again. And that's exactly what Mario Wonder felt like to me. It felt like a modern equivalent to Mario World, taking the formula set up by the new Super Mario Bros. games and just going to town with secrets and zany creative ideas, the latter especially. The Wonder Flower does a lot in making each level stand out from one another. And like with Pizza Tower, the crazy ideas thrown at the wall stick solidly 9 times out of 10. Whether it be transforming you directly and changing how you traverse the level, introducing a larger than life set piece, having the enemies burst into song, which I'm so happy happened on more than one occasion, Mario Wonder is filled to the brim with creativity, something that the developers were given as much time as they needed to prototype. Can we normalize that more in this industry, please? But even beyond the presence of the Wonder Flower, Mario Wonder is easily the most I've enjoyed a 2D Mario game in a long time. From the beautiful new art style and animations, to the new badge system that, while having some badges that were kinda eh, adds a lot of options for enhancing the experience, to the previously mentioned emphasis on secrets, giving us that same level of craftiness that Mario World had back in the SNES era, to the new power-ups. Of course we've got the Elephant Power and all its... weirdness. But then we've also got the Bubble Flower and the Drill Mushroom, both of which add a ton to the experience both in taking out enemies and in getting around. The Drill Mushroom especially I found myself using a lot when I got the chance to, it was fun to mess with. And on top of all that, there's the online functionality. I wasn't expecting to use this nearly as much as I did, but I ended up really liking these features. I did get a chance to play specifically with friends online, and the races we did were fun to partake in, but even just having random players running through the levels in real time alongside me, helping each other out in various ways along the way, they were total strangers, and yet I felt a sense of camaraderie throughout my playthrough. It was really cool. Sure, part of me will miss the chaos of the new Super Mario Bros. Wii days, but I do feel like this is a really good compromise. The one issue I had with Mario Wonder is that, for as crazy and creative the levels constantly got, the same cannot be said about the game's bosses. Like yeah, bosses have generally never really been one of 2D Mario's strengths, but even on that low standard, Wonder's bosses are really lacking, with almost all of them being very samey fights against Bowser Jr. Even the final boss, which I won't spoil, is rather basic as a fight, though the presentation of it definitely gives it some points for memorability. That said though, bosses aside, I had a wonderful time with Mario Wonder, pun intended. And side note, for being his first outing as the new voice of the iconic Plumber Bros, Kevin Afghani does a pretty solid job, and I'm sure it's something he's only going to continue getting better at as time goes on. Though on the topic of voices in the game, one last thing I wanted to say. The Talking Flowers were a fantastic addition, and they always managed to put a smile on my face. Make one playable in the next Mario Kart game, Nintendo.
Oh, I've been looking forward to talking about this game. So you know how with the rise of indie games over the past decade or so, we've seen an especially notable number of titles directly inspired by Mega Man? Whether that be looser inspiration with games like Shovel Knight, or much more direct inspiration with games like Azure Striker Gunvolt, 20XDX, and... Well, make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night. Yeah, that. Well, this past year, we got another indie game that proudly wears its Mega Man inspiration on its sleeves. And I'm gonna be honest, this is my favorite of them yet. This is Gravity Circuit, a 2D action platformer where you control Kai, the titular Gravity Circuit and one of nine circuit heroes who helps defend the world from the Mavericks, I mean the Virus Army. But with the Virus Army now having made a return, and with the other eight circuits having shockingly sided with the enemy this time around, it's up to Kai to seek out his former comrades, neutralize the threats they put on the world, and put a stop to the Virus Army once and for all. So yeah, like I said, Gravity Circuit proudly wears its inspiration on its sleeves, following the footsteps of the Mega Man X and Mega Man Zero games in particular. Which hey, those are my favorite sets of Mega Man games, so this game had my attention right out the gate. And the way it adapts those formulas into its own thing is EXCELLENTLY done! Instead of running gunning or simple hack and slashing, Kai's means of taking down the Virus Army is with his bare hands. And the beat em up-esque combat here feels GREAT! But things get especially fun after you've made your enemies vulnerable, because instead of blowing up right away, they'll remain stunned, giving you a chance to grab them with your grappling hook so you can pick them up and throw them. Also yes, you have a grappling hook in this game, which gives it immediate extra cool points. You can throw enemies in any direction and straight up use them as projectiles against other enemies, and it consistently feels superb to do. You can even grab certain projectiles like missiles and bombs and throw them back. There's a lot of options on hand when fighting your way through the Virus Army, and that's all before mentioning the abilities you unlock after each circuit's defeat. See, instead of getting a single, permanent new ability after each boss, like in classic Mega Man fashion, multiple abilities tied to the boss you just beat show up in the shop. You can equip up to four at any time, and these serve as Smash Bros-esque special moves, ranging from a quick heal, to a super beam, to a suplex attack, just to name a few. And couple that with additional upgrades you can get from saving innocence in each of the stages, which can be used to help ease the play experience with stuff like a double jump or increasing your attack range, there's a lot of creative freedom in your choice of loadout. And that was all BEFORE the post-launch updates. Since the game came out, they've also added the ability to save and swap out up to three loadouts at any point of play, and an additional shop where you not only change Kai's color palette, but give him an additional ability on top of everything he already has, depending on which color he currently is. And that's without even mentioning the sense of speed and flow Kai has in his movement, allowing you to zip through levels like a robot ninja once you've mastered your skills. Which on that note, let's get to those levels, because they do some really cool stuff with them. Each level is masterfully designed with that classic design philosophy of introducing an idea in a relatively safe way, allowing the player to get accustomed to what this new element does, before putting them through gradually trickier challenges with said element. Stuff like beams that go off once you pass by their line of sight, or platforms that briefly get electrocuted if any kind of electric Tristy hits them. The difficulty curve in each of these levels is flawless, with no new idea ever feeling like it's too jarring. But then, on top of that, all the stage and bosses also incorporate these ideas into their means of attacking, serving as a final test of the elements you've been overcoming. Like with the Optic Circuit Ray, who will reflect beam attacks all over the arena. Or the Power Circuit Cable, whose arena is coated with those electrocution platforms and, you guessed it, he primarily uses electric-based attacks. And they do this with every main level and its end boss in the game. It's so sick. And it helps that each level and boss are so unique from one another, giving distinct and equally fun challenges for the entire game. But believe it or not, That's not even the best of it. Like in classic Mega Man fashion, there's a final stretch of levels after you beat all the main levels, where you fight the last few story bosses, go through a boss rush, and then wrap up the game. And even the way it handles that is EXCELLENTLY done! Both with the levels themselves mixing together the different stage gimmicks from the stages before, and ESPECIALLY with the bosses. I'm not going to go into detail on all of them because I do not want to ruin those surprises for you, but I will go into one specifically. That being how the game handles its boss rush. So, remember the weapons archive from Mega Man 10? That one boss that would swap between the weapons of bosses from previous games? So this game has a boss like that, but way crazier, as the boss will switch between the projectiles of all the previous circuit bosses, while also quick transitioning into each of the traditional boss rematches you'd expect from a Mega Man game. Like, they seriously took the boss rush trope and found a way to make it feel fresh and hectic and crazy fun. And that's not even the best boss from this final set of levels, but I don't want to ruin that surprise for everybody. 
everybody. And I haven't even gotten into the music yet. The game was composed by Dominic Ninmark, the same one behind those Eurobeat game music covers on YouTube. And man, he gives his A game with this soundtrack. Though also, as it turns out, he was one of the lead devs on the project. And if my gushing hasn't made it apparent yet, he and the rest of the devs absolutely gave their A game with making Gravity Circuit as a whole. Seriously, if you're even just a slight fan of platformers, especially Mega Man platformers, you need to play this game. It's fantastic, easily my favorite indie game of 2023. As for my favorite game of 2023 as a whole though, you all know where this is going. Yeah, my number one was far from a well-kept secret. Anyone who's seen my review of Hi-Fi Rush knows just how much I loved it, but if you haven't, well, long story short, I really loved Hi-Fi Rush. It was such an incredible surprise right from the get-go. A rhythm action game that harkened back to the style of the GameCube and PS2 era, from a AAA studio known for horror games, that got both revealed and released on the same day, right at the start of the year? This is like the complete opposite of how most AAA studios do games nowadays. But hey, shoutouts to Tango Gameworks for not only trying something different in 2023, but nailing it in the execution. I'm already a fan of both spectacle fighter action games and rhythm games, and the idea of bringing them together like this just seemed perfect. And I know Hi-Fi Rush isn't the first game to try and do this, but the way it handles the idea was borderline flawless, tying just about every element of gameplay to the beat of the music. From your movement and attacks, to the timing of stage hazards, to your enemies' movement and attacks, all the while giving you plenty of visual cues to keep on beat. As such, even when the game builds up the intensity and enemy numbers, it never feels overwhelming, and it consistently makes for really satisfying combat. Sure, there's some minor annoyances here and there, but it never feels like a massive hindrance, and all that's before mentioning elements like parrying, and by extension the parry and dodge rhythm clashes, which I consistently enjoy doing, and all these elements just get amped up even further when the bosses come into play. Each boss provides its own unique experience from the rest, focusing on different aspects of your skill set, and providing very different kinds of challenges to overcome. And like I said in my review, not a single boss in this game is bad or even just alright, they're all great. And what also helps with that is the boss characters themselves, and by extension, the game's characters and writing as a whole. Hi-Fi Rush tells a really endearing story of a bunch of lovable misfits banding together to free a once benevolent tech company of its cartoonishly evil executives. And both sides of the conflict contain a wonderfully written cast who provide plenty of laughs but also plenty of heart. It's a game that knows how to balance its funny humor with its heartfelt moments. And sure, it may come off as corny to some, but compared to the overly cynical and self-deprecative style of writing we often see nowadays, I'll definitely take the game that's not only not afraid to be silly, but embraces it wholeheartedly. Like I said earlier, we don't often get games like this from the AAA industry anymore, so it's such a pleasant treat when we actually do, especially when it turns out as fantastic as it did here. And of course, no good rhythm game is complete without a solid soundtrack, and Hi-Fi Rush has not one, but two solid soundtracks. Sure, not every streamer mode song lives up to its licensed counterpart, but a majority of them do. And there's a couple cases where I actually kind of prefer the streamer mode variant. But regardless of if you go with the licensed music or the streamer mode music, you're in for an absolute musical treat as you play through this fun-filled adventure. It really does feel like a GameCube PS2 era game brought into the current generation in the absolute best way possible. It's no competition for me. Hi-Fi Rush is easily my favorite game of 2023. And the fact that we might be seeing it come to other consoles in the future, going off recent rumors, makes me all the happier. More people deserve to give this amazing game a go. Also, I just realized that Hi-Fi Rush broke the pattern set by my previous games of the year. It's not a Brazilian made indie platformer. Whoops. And that now brings us to the end of this longer than initially planned journey. Like I said earlier, I don't think 2023 has been the absolute best year for games, largely thanks to all the issues going on for developers, but it's hard to deny that many of the new releases we saw last year were spectacular, even beyond the largely talked about mega hits. But with that said, what were some of your favorite games from 2023? Feel free to share in the comments, I'd love to see what kind of games ended up winning you all over. But on that note, I think it's time to finally wrap this all up. This has been Benjamin Mage, thank you all for watching, and until the next video, have a nice day, everybody.